right there. Can you hear me? All right. Good afternoon. <laughs> One more time. No, just <laughs> okay. How many of you were here last year to see Russ? Okay. How about uh, two years ago? Three years ago. Okay. <laughs> uh, he, had, he appeared in LA in, uh, three years ago. I know Tim and I were there and a bunch of folks. And that's when we had the idea to uh, uh, bring Russ in. So he, this is the third year. And uh, Russ was wondering, um, because of the pending sale, if this would be the last time he would appear in this room. I said, no, we're going to come back next year. And it'd be, uh, uh, we're working on dates, but it'll be um, early March. It'll be one day here followed by a day in Huntington Beach. In fact, uh, Russ appears in Huntington Beach tomorrow. It'll be an all-day session. Uh, this morning we videotaped, this afternoon we're videotaping, tomorrow we'll be videotaped. And all these videos will be available through the lending library. We have uh, Russ's permission to distribute them within Boeing. And so uh, you can go ahead and borrow those. Uh, these sessions, as well as you know, the, the Thinking Roadmap classes, the Into and Thinking Network Forum, are all about getting people within the organization, you know, the one global enterprise or whatever we're about to become, you know, thinking about thinking. And, and in a class recently where someone said, well, what's, what's wrong with an organization where people come to work each day just focusing on doing? I said, well, what if the future changes? <laughs> How will they adapt? And so Russ has made a career helping people think about thinking, and he's got, you know, he'll fill you with three and a half hours of stories, and we can go even, even you know, beyond that. Um, so he's, I figured, you know, uh, I believe he is well positioned to help us once a year think about thinking. Um, for those of you who don't know, if you didn't see his bio, Russ is a retired professor from the University of Pennsylvania. He's done consulting for the major companies. He's worked for, employed by the, or invited to work with the Shah of Iran. So he's uh, been around the block. And I asked him to uh, spend this afternoon Realizing the audience includes people who may not have seen him before. In fact, how many of you are seeing Russ for the first time? Okay, can you deal with variation? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. Well, given this variation, he's going to give you uh, Russ's worldview 2005 for the next uh, three and a half hours. I'll turn it over to Russ. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this really is the most difficult kind of a situation to find yourself in as a speaker, since a lot of you know the background that I need to talk about other subjects, and some of you don't. So I'm going to try to compromise and spend a few minutes, maybe a little longer, reviewing quickly what I've been over before in previous sessions and what I was over this morning in the session. I'm going to do it fairly quickly, but you have to help me, because what I say and what you hear may be very different things. And it's only by feedback that I can tell whether I'm wasting your time by going very quickly uh, through the past before I get to the future. Okay? Uh, asking you to participate is always dangerous. I was recently in Edinburgh, Scotland, talking about this subject, and I started as I usually do by saying, please don't hesitate to break in at any time, because I've heard all this before. What I haven't heard is you, so please let me hear from you. That turned out to be a terrible mistake, because they took me literally. The trouble was I couldn't understand a word they said. <laughs> I had to get a simultaneous translator uh, to deal with their questions. Well, I told this story when I got back. I came back through Toronto and gave a talk in Toronto and one of my Canadian friends said, you think the problem is Scotland? He said, we got the problem here in Canada. He said, let me tell you about our previous prime minister, Mulroney. He said, when well, Mulroney was prime minister of Canada, he went up and spent three days with George Bush the elder, and the two of them designed the North American Free Trade Act, NAFTA. And after three very productive days, they sat in front of the fireplace in the White House, having a drink before Mulroney left. In the course of that conversation, Mulroney said to Bush, he said, George, you obviously have a wonderful staff. They reduce your workload significantly. I just admire the way 
you depend on them and how they help you, reinforce you. He said, my staff just creates work for me. I don't know how to get good people. What do you do? Oh, Bush said, it's simple. He said, I have a little examination that I use as a filter that separates the good from the bad. And when he said, you do? He said, can I see it? He said, I'll give you a demonstration. He picked up the phone and got a secretary. He said, find Dan Quayle and send him in. A few moments later, Dan Quayle came in and Bush introduced Quayle to Mulroney. He said, Dan, I have a question for you. Your father had three children. One was your brother, one was your sister. Who was the third? <laughs> and Quayle stood there deeply in thought. <laughs> and after a minute, he suddenly he said, I got it. He said, me. Bush said, you're absolutely right. You can go now. He left. Mulroney said, now come on. You don't mean that simple-minded question tells you the difference between a good and a bad staff member. Bush said, it never fails. Mulroney said, well, I don't believe it. But I'm desperate, so I'll try it when I get back home. When he got back to Canada, he called in Clark, the deputy prime minister, and said, Clark, I've got a question for you. Your father had three children. One was your brother, one was your sister. Who was the third? And Clark stood there deeply in thought with his brow furrowed. He said, look, boss, he said, that's a tough one. Give me a little time, and I'll come back to you with the answer. And he walked out of the room deeply in thought, going down the hall with his head bowed, and he bumped into Wilson, the minister of finance. Hey, Wilson, he said, maybe you can help me. The boss has given me a question I'm having some trouble with. He said, your father had three children. One was your brother, one was your sister. Who was the third? And Wilson looked at him with absolute amazement. He said, you can't be serious. The answer is obvious. And Clark said, it is. Well, what is it? And Wilson said, it's me. I said, Clark, I got it. And he ran back in the Mulroney's office. He said, I got the answer, boss. It's Wilson. <laughs> Mulroney said, no, you're wrong, it's quail. <laughs> now, well, even, in the, even in the same language, communication is difficult. So I want to review very quickly, in a few, relatively few minutes, the basic material, but you stop me if I get too far, too quickly. I started with a quotation which is reflected in a number of different things that are currently being said that we're entering a new era, a new age, and that an age is characterized by a change in the way we think. It's a cultural change in the principal mode of thinking that characterizes the change of age. The last one was the Renaissance. They don't happen very often, and we're in the early stages of a new one. The concept which is responsible for the change in the way of thinking is a concept of a system it was, a re it was the appearance of a book in 1954 which led science to start to think about what a system is and to discover that there are certain limitations to our way of thinking when it comes to fundamental questions about systems. What is a system and what's the kind of problem it creates? Well, a system is a whole spelled with a W that's always defined by its function in the larger whole of which it's a part. So you define an automobile, for example, as an instrument for carrying people from one place to another on land under their control and in privacy. You describe its function. A computer, you don't talk about how it works. You talk about what it does, its role or function. So all systems are defined by their role in a larger system of which they are part. And that role or function depends on the performance of certain essential parts. The essential parts are parts without which it can't perform that function. So in the case of an automobile, the motor is essential because it can't run without one. The fuel pump is essential, a battery. But the windshield wiper, the door handle, the cigarette lighter, the rug on the floor, none of those are essential. In your case, your heart, your lungs, your brain are all essential. But your fingers, your hands, your arms, your legs are not essential. You can live without them. But you can't live without a brain or a heart. So the essential parts of a system have to satisfy three conditions. The first was that each essential part of a system can affect the behavior or properties of the whole. And if you remember, I used the example where a doctor complained because it was one part of the body that's not known to have any effect on it. And when I asked him what it was, he said the appendix, and then I asked him what the word appendix means. It means an attachment or an add-on. 
If they ever find a use for the appendix, then they have to change its name. So every part of a system can affect its behavior or its properties. Secondly, the way it affects the whole depends on what at least one other part is doing, which is the same as saying that no essential part has an independent effect on the whole. The way the motor affects an automobile depends on the fuel pump. Because if the fuel pump stops operating, the motor won't operate. The fuel pump depends on the battery, but the battery depends on the motor. And so the dependencies are continuous and they form, the essential parts form what's called a connected set. Finally, if you take the essential parts of a system and put them together into subsets in the human body, the motor system, the metabolic system, the nervous system, and an automobile, what's called the drivetrain, the steering system, the braking system, those subsystems have the same two properties as the parts. They can affect the behavior or properties of the part of the whole, but none of them has an independent effect on the whole. And therefore, the essential characteristic of a system depends on how its parts interact, not on how they act taken separately. This had two important consequences, which we discussed in the earlier sessions. First, no part of a system can perform the function that the system as a whole can. See, you are a system, a biological system, whose essential property is life. And the amazing thing about you is that no part of you lives, but you live. Okay. The automobile can carry you from one place to another, but no part of an automobile can carry you from one place to another. The body can, the motor can, the fuel pump can, the wheels can. And moreover, when you take the system apart, because it depends on the interaction of its parts, when you break those interactions, you destroy the system. So if I brought an automobile in this room and disassembled it, although every part is in this room, I don't have an automobile. Because contrary to a familiar statement, a system is not the sum of its parts. It is the product of their interactions. And therefore, when a system is taken apart, it loses all of its essential properties, and so do its parts. See, when I take the automobile apart and have it in this room, it can't carry you from one place to another. It's not an automobile. But moreover, the parts aren't the same parts. An automobile cannot move without a motor. But if I take the motor out of the automobile, it can't move anything, including itself. It just sits there. You cannot think without a brain. But if your brain is removed surgically and put on a table, it doesn't sit there and think. It just sits there. You think the brain is an instrument for thought. So no part of a system can perform the function that the system as a whole can perform. And when it is taken apart, both the whole and the parts lose their essential properties. And I explained, if you recall, when we were together last time, this is why a business school is a waste of time. Because like all sciences, it's concerned with the behavior of the parts taken separately. That's called analysis. You take the parts, take the thing apart, and then try to understand the behavior of the parts, and then aggregate the understanding of the behavior of the parts into an understanding of the whole, and that's a waste of time. Because it's the interaction of the parts that's critical. In a business school, you learn about marketing, production, finance, and personnel as separate subjects, and they're not separable. It's like setting the motor of an automobile with no connection to the fuel pump, or the battery, or the distributor. Then studying another course on the distributor, and another one on the battery, and thinking you're gonna come out with an understanding of the automobile. You don't even come out with an understanding of the parts. Because the essential thing about marketing is how it interacts with production and finance and personnel. Not how it acts, but how it interacts with the other essential parts. Therefore, the performance of a system, and this was the first important conclusion I drew the last time we were together, is that when you improve the performance of the parts of a system taken separately, you do not necessarily improve the performance of the whole, and you are very likely to destroy the whole by making the parts better. Now, that's completely counterintuitive, and it violates a fundamental principle of Western management, which is divide and conquer. The assumption in the West is you break the corporation up into divisions or departments or subsidiaries, whatever you want to call them. 
the government into various agencies, transportation, health, criminal justice, and so on, make each one run as well as possible on the whole will. That's absolutely false. If you will recall, I didn't try to prove that to you, but I gave you an example, which I hope would show you that it's true. But if you collected one each of every automobile that was available, and they had a group of engineers tell you which car had the best motor, say a Rolls Royce, then which one had the best transmission, say a Mercedes, which one had the best fuel pump, maybe a Lincoln, and one by one you took every essential part and found out which automobile had the best of them, then got your engineers to take those parts off those cars and put them together into an automobile that consists only of the best available parts, would you get the best automobile? The answer is obvious, you would not. In fact, you would not even get an automobile. Why not? Because the parts don't fit. It's how the parts work together that determines the performance of the whole, not how they work separately. If you've got a car that is underpowered, say a Hyundai, you try to put a Rolls Royce motor in to increase its power, you won't get a better car, you get a car that doesn't work. For one thing, you won't be able to close the hood, the motor's too damn big. But even if you could, the other parts aren't designed to work with that kind of motor. And so, one important characteristic of a system that most managers are completely unaware of is you can frequently make a system perform better by making a part perform worse. And if you recall, I used an example of an architect designing a house. It was a real example of a house I once had to design back in my youth when I was in architecture. Where after a house was designed, the housewife was worried because the party room was down below, the kitchen was up above, and she didn't want to keep running up and down the stairs when they had company. And she wanted a dumb waiter to facilitate the process of transmitting food and drinks. And the only way of putting a dumb waiter in the house was to take counter space away from the kitchen. And she insisted on it. So she made the kitchen worse, but the house better. I pointed out that in management, the only place I've ever seen this done is in the supermarket where they have a loss leader. They take a product of which the price is generally well known and offer it for sale below cost. Bread is a common one, milk is another one. You offer bread to customers at below what it costs you. Why would you do that? To attract a customer who will buy the profitable product, so you make the total profit benefit from the loss of a single product. So management has to be concerned with the interaction of parts, not the action of the parts taken separately. So the performance of the whole can be reduced when the performance of a part is increased because the performance of the system is not the sum of the performance of the parts, but the product of their interactions. So the most important thing that a manager can know, I argued before, is how the parts of a system interact and how those interactions affect the performance of the whole, not how the parts act taken separately, which is what current management tries to understand. Now, finally, I argue that it's through design that one comes to understand how the parts of a system interact. I have a colleague who did a wonderful thing about two years ago. He was asked to teach a course in accounting to graduate students, and he had never had a course in accounting and didn't consider himself to be an expert in the field, but it turned out that the dean was in trouble because the accountants were off on a holiday somewhere for the year and asked Jam Sheed to fill in. So he said, how in the world do you teach a course in a subject you don't know anything about? Well, he was working at the time as a consultant on a company, and he had the students in the course design an accounting system for that company. That was their term project, to design an accounting system for that company. At the end of the year, they took examinations in accounting and passed two years of accounting on the basis of what they learned in one semester by design. Because when you design an automobile, you can't do it unless you understand how it works. So design is a way of getting to understand the way the parts of a system interact. And I discuss a particular kind of design called idealized design, in which you assume that the system you're concerned with was destroyed last night, and you redesign it from scratch, 
asking yourself, what would I do if I could do whatever I wanted, subject to only a couple constraints that were minor? It can't be science fiction, and it must be a system that could survive in the current environment if it came into existence. And subject to those two constraints, what would you have if you could have whatever you wanted to? And then you completely change the nature of planning. In conventional planning, the planner or the manager who's doing the planning stands in the present, gets a vision of where they want to be in the future, and then their plan is a path of how do I get from where I am to where I want to be. When design is used, two changes occur. First, you start with where you want to be right now. I don't have to worry about five or ten years from now because if I don't know where I want to be right now, how in the world can I know where I want to be five or ten years from now? That's nonsense. If I know where I want to be right now, then I plan backwards from there to here, not from here to there. That requires a counterintuitive jump that doesn't come to us naturally, but nevertheless, it's true and can be proven scientifically. When you want to go from A to B and you're looking for the best path, it is always best to work from B to A than from A to B. It's, it's counterintuitive. If I want to go from here to San Francisco and find the best road to, to drive on, it turns out the best way to do that is work backwards from San Francisco to Canoga Park. But you say, suppose I'm in San Francisco and want to drive to Canoga Park. Are you telling me I ought to work from Canoga Park back to San Francisco? Yes. Doesn't make sense, does it? But it's true. And I pointed out the children know this. They're much smarter than we are. How does a child solve a maze? By working from the exit to the entrance. It is always easier. They don't know why, but it is. And it is because the number of alternatives that have to be considered is significantly reduced. If you recall, the very simple example I used was 64 players entering Wimbledon. How many matches have to be played? Well, a conventional way is if there are 64 players, there have to be 32 matches in the first round then 16, then 8, then 4, then 2, then 1. You add them up. Turns out to be 63. But suppose you start at the end. Wimbledon is over. We had 64 players in the tournament. How many losers did there have to be? 63. I didn't have to do any arithmetic. And you can show that in most problems, when you do it backwards, you eliminate the number of alternatives you have to consider significantly. So that type of planning significantly reduces the complexity of planning and it completely changes your concept of what is feasible and it unleashes a tremendous amount of creativity because it removes constraining assumptions. See, creativity consists of merely eliminating assumptions which you incorrectly make that limit the number of alternatives that you consider. And the easiest way to see that is the difference between a puzzle and a problem. What's the difference? The puzzle is a problem you have difficulty solving because of an assumption you make. That's why when you see the solution of a puzzle, you don't always want to kick yourself. Because the obstruction was you, not something out there. You didn't see a possibility that existed because you made a wrong assumption. And once you get the assumption right and explore the consequences, your behavior is creative. So this type of planning then using design makes things feasible that weren't otherwise feasible, gives you creative solutions that you would not otherwise get. And I think that about does it uh, as far as a review. It brings me up to the point that in order to formulate a vision, which is an idealized redesign of an organization, a leader is required and emerges. And I want to talk about leadership, which goes beyond anything I talked about before. I'd like to stop now and see if you have any questions about this overly rapid review of 15 three-hour graduate sessions. <laughs> any question? Okay, well, give me a second. I'm going to switch off of here and come to leadership.
There we are. The essential thing about a change of age, as I indicated, is a change in the way of thinking. And we characterize that change now as systems thinking. Systems thinking, which uses design as its uh, uh, paradigm, so to speak, is synthetic thinking as opposed to analytic thinking. It results from putting things together rather than taking them apart. Uh, you cannot produce a vision, an idealized design, without leadership. The trouble is that we have as little understanding of the nature of leadership in our society as we do of design and of systems. The terrible consequence is of the fact that we have courses coming out of our ears which claim to produce leaders. It's not possible. It's absolutely impossible to create a leader. You cannot do it. These courses are sheer con games. Now, I have to explain all that. You see, there's a difference between an administrator, a manager, and a leader. And that difference is absolutely essential. An administrator is one who directs others in the pursuit of ends by the use of means dictated by a third party. So the person who runs, let's say, the accounts payable section or the billing section, He's a supervisor running a bunch of clerks doing a task to accomplish an objective which his boss told him he wants accomplished by means established by the profession of accounting or whoever has established them. It's the lowest form of the direction of others. A manager is one who directs others in the pursuit of ends by the use of means that he selects, not that a third party selects. But the real jump comes when you come to leadership. Because the leader is one who guides others in the pursuit of ends by the use of means that they select. See, we think of leadership as command and control. That's not leadership, that's management. A leader can't lead without followers. And followers must be voluntary. If they're not voluntary, they're not following. It's very different. A chain gang are not following the leader. They're passing behind them, but not following it. Now, why do I say you cannot produce a leader? Leadership has two main functions. And by the way, the best book on leadership I've ever read is a little paperback book written by uh, Jan Carlson, who was a former CEO of SAS Airlines, who converted that unprofitable airlines into the most profitable airline in the world. And he wrote this marvelous little book on how he did it. It's called Moments of Truth. And he says the two essential functions of a leader are first to create a vision and develop strategies for its effective pursuit. But that vision must be one that's shared by the people that must pursue it. It has to be participatively formulated. So it has to be formulated and subscribed to by the heads of the different units that are going to have to pursue it. And the other is to create an environment in which people can pursue that design. Now, how do you do these things? First, the manager is going to have to, a manager will have to manage interactions, but so will a leader. Have to be able to monitor progress and correct errors, but most importantly, you must be able to inspire those who must pursue the vision by applying the strategy. The core concept of leadership is inspiration. Is that the result of scientific activity? That's an artistic activity. That's aesthetic. Leadership is an art, not a science. You see, I can teach you how to draw. I can teach anybody how to draw. But I sure as hell can't teach you to be an artist. Because the difference between a draftsman and an artist is something called talent. And talent is something you either have or you don't as an act of birth. Now, we all have some talent, but in different things. So some can be a good artist, graphic artist, others can write music. Some may be able to lead managers in a corporate leadership. 
But unless the talent is there, you cannot have a leader. Now you can improve leadership by providing it with tools and techniques and enable them to lead better than they would otherwise. If I have a good student in art that looks like he's a potential artist, I can teach him a lot about color and harmony of color and about the application to a canvas, which will help him be a better artist. But I can't take a good draftsman and make an artist out of him. What I can do is make a better manager out of him by giving him some of the tools that a leader can use. But a leader does not have to be the one that formulates the vision. He has to be able to articulate it. Uh, let's look at some of the most prominent leaders in our own lifetime. They don't have to be, by the way, leaders of something you like. See, Lenin was an incredible leader. He led a massive revolution in one of the largest countries in the world, but he didn't formulate the vision. Who formulated the vision that Lenin articulated? Marx. See, But he could articulate, well, Marx couldn't lead anybody. He was a mathematician. He wrote a good book on the calculus, as well as Das Kapital, but he couldn't lead. He was, he was a dull, introverted person. But Lenin could take those ideas and articulate them and lead a revolution out of them. If you look at the people who led most revolutions, there are ones who took the ideas of others and were able to consolidate them and put them together into a mobilizing idea. There's a wonderful little book called The Mission of the University, which is an entirely misleading title. It's written by a Spanish philosopher, Jose Ortega y Gasset. He was a very liberal philosopher in Spain who was forced to emigrate when Franco came to power because he was too liberal. He lived in France until Frank, Franco was overcome and he returned to the University of Madrid and they had a big celebration and he gave a series of uh, lectures. Uh, he never wrote his lectures, but his students kept very detailed notes. He died shortly thereafter, and the students took his lectures and published them in a book called The Mission of the University. And it's an unbelievable book, because what he did was ask the following question. If I take all of the major revolutions in the history of the Western world, do they have any characteristics in common? And he found one characteristic in common to all revolutions. He called it a mobilizing idea. So, for example, Christianity was one, the Industrial Revolution was another, the Reformation was another. These are ideas which mobilize people into a willingness to run sacrifices in the short run in order to make a long-term gain. An inspiring vision must have two properties. It must hold forth a vision of a future that's worth pursuing even if current sacrifices are necessary but it must also make the pursuit worthwhile. Now, that turns out to be very interesting. Pursuit of a vision is a very creative act. Making it worthwhile is a very recreative act. The two aspects of aesthetics are enjoying what you're doing for its own sake and feeling that you're getting somewhere by doing it which is the creative aspect, the inspirational aspect. So leadership is an art, not a science. And you can't teach a person to be an artist. You can teach them to draft, that's management. I can teach you how to be a manager. You can't teach a leadership. Therefore, these courses, which are leadership development courses, are absolute nonsense. They're management development courses. There are very few people who are capable of effective leadership, but there are more of them than you would guess because they're normally hidden down in an organization and suppressed because the one thing that scares managers the most is having their responsibility taken over by a leader. So they make damn sure they don't appear conspicuously if they're down there somewhere. The mission of an organization should be the pursuit of a vision and a vision is to a mission what the Holy Grail was to the Crusades. So uh, the vision is the Holy Grail. The Crusades is the mission 
that you're off on. And so there's a complete parallel. An effective leader essentially creates a crusade within the organization in which the Holy Grail is the vision that he formulates, even though he may not have been the, the source of that vision. I mentioned Ortega y Gasset. Here's the wonderful quote from him, which makes this point. Man has been able to grow enthusiastic over his vision of unconvincing enterprises. He has put himself to work for the sake of an idea, seeking by magnificent exertions to arrive at the incredible. And in the end, he has arrived there. Beyond all doubt, it is one of the vital sources of man's power to be thus able to kindle enthusiasms from the mere glimmer of something improbable difficult and remote. You know, one of the things I'm most confronted with when I give examples of idealized designs and organizations is going to be very, very difficult to realize. Now, that's an incredible statement because it says that anything worthwhile ought to be simple to get. Now, what a stupid idea that is. If it were simple, of course, we'd be there. Simplicity and difficulty should be no criterion in deciding what it is that we want to do. It's whether or not it's a good idea that should determine what we want to do. The core idea and the vision need not be the leaders, and examples are Lenin and Marx, Washington, and Jefferson. Washington did not formulate the ideas of our democracy. They came from Paine and Jefferson and others. But the formulation of the idea must be the leaders. The formulation must be. And it doesn't have to be ethically good, because Hitler was a great leader towards a terrible end, but so was Stalin, and similarly. So leadership is not good or evil. What is the vision determines whether it's good or evil. So leadership requires the ability to bring the will of others in the consonants with the will of the leader so that they'll follow voluntarily. And that's the critical property. He's not forcing anybody to follow, but they follow uh, voluntarily. And this contrasts with command and control in which the commander can coerce others to follow. General Patton was not a great leader. He was a great commander. It's very different. Eisenhower was a leader because he had people follow him because he held out a vision that they believed in and were willing to make sacrifices for. He very seldom exercised authority to get others to do what he wanted them to do. But he persuaded them that doing what he wanted them to do was what they wanted to do. Okay. So much for leadership. Any questions, objections, or issues you want to raise about? Please. You see, we use the word, it's very ambiguous, and you're right to pick out this ambiguity. If I have a guide that takes me on a hike through the woods, you can say he leads me through the woods. That's not the concept of leadership I'm using. I make a difference between a guide and a leader. He's taking me on a path that he's familiar with and I'm not. He's not producing a vision and inspiring me to pursue it. So I'm taking a very different than normal concept of what leadership is. But the value of this definition is, it explains why these courses on leadership don't produce leaders. There was an incredible study done at Columbia University recently. Columbia University is one of the oldest leadership development programs in the world, let alone the United States. It occurred to some of the graduates of Columbia University to run a survey uh, involving people who had attended the leadership courses. They went and interviewed their peers. So if you attended a course, a year later they came and they found out that you work with these three people next to you. They interviewed those three people and asked them a simple question. What changes in your behavior had they observed? You know what the outstanding answer was? Nothing. Nothing. Those courses do not produce a change. They can. 
because it requires talent. If you don't have it, I can't make you have it. See. So I'm not interested in the guide, I'm interested in the leader. Yeah. You don't have to identify them. You have to give them an opportunity to emerge and they become recognizable. I, I can describe one exercise of this form. There's a company in Pittsburgh called Highland Patterson, which is an engineering construction company. And it was owned by a single individual who created it and it was a very big company. He had six vice presidents and he announced that he was going to retire. And one of the vice presidents immediately would be made the CEO. The internal warfare that began, the political infighting was bitter. Each one of the six was trying to make the other five look bad so he would be selected, and the result was they all looked terrible. The old man, uh, Mr. Patterson, called us in and said, can you help me pick the successor? Well, we knew the company, we'd worked in it, we said there are two people who are not vice presidents you ought to consider. And he said, that's okay. So when we now had eight people. Now what we did is we picked nine problems that the corporation currently had that were significant problems. We brought the group together on successive days. And the first day, they were given one of the real problems. This is the six vice presidents plus two. And one of the vice presidents was asked to chair the session. They got nowhere. They never got over the hump of internal organization. This happened for seven consecutive days on seven consecutive problems. On the eighth day, the young man we pulled from the planning department was chairing the session and it started with the usual stuff. And then he did it. we were observing this. He got angry and he stood up on the table and said, shut up you bastards. We're not getting anywhere. He said, now either get to work or get the hell out of here. This young kid. And they all were stunned. And they turned out a product at the end of that session. The next day they got the last problem with no organizational structure. And the first thing they did was elect him as the chairman of the session. See, <laughs> the point is nobody appointed him. But performance dictated that he was going to be the one that could lead. Okay. Yeah. Just may address Jim's question a little bit. Um, so Boeing, at a top level, interviews people to find out what experiences have contributed to them showing their leadership traits. In most cases, it's a script, something difficult, something unfamiliar, and uh, or being asked to turn around a full business area. So to that end, it seems like sometimes Difficult settings like your example, or the ones that, that Boeing selects, are the places where the leaders emerge. It's well, obviously, a leader of a group of people has to understand whatever it is that group of people are doing. What's the nature of the system in which they're sharing in common? So it's very unlikely that you could take a person who is a leader at Procter and Gamble and make a leader out of him in, in Boeing. There used to be the myth that a manager is a manager, and that's probably true, but it's not true that a leader is a leader. You can't take a leader in the field of music and make him a leader in the corporate uh, world. You have to know something about the system in order to be able to articulate a vision that's inspiring. So uh, you have to look at the way people talk about the system they're a part of. Can they do it in a way which excites you? Yeah. The past uh, few years, I've been made aware, I think, in fact, I'm curious, that the difference between leadership and management is that management is, is in charge of making things happen, whereas leadership is in charge of vision. I'm not sure what your question is. If it is, can you do away with management? The answer is no. A manager, a leader can't operate without managers. I haven't got to my question. I'm sorry? I have not got to my question. I'm not sure I have one. I'm making an observation. So what I'm hearing hear you say now, I, I differentiate between a leader and a manager in that way. 
what I'm hearing now is that within management, there is a leadership aspect. No. I'm saying you can be a very good manager and you don't have any leadership capability at all. But you can get the job done. But it's a job that you perceive, it's not visionary. So most corporations are run by managers, uh, not by leaders. Uh, how many of you, I mentioned at lunch, you know SAS, the software company in North Carolina? Do you know Herman Miller Furniture Company? Do you know Westinghouse Furniture Systems? Do you know Gore-Tec? These are companies that have leaders in the CEO position, and they are very different kinds of companies than ones that are managed. Now, if you know those companies, I don't have to describe the difference. They're entirely different because they don't look like any other company that you look at. He produced, the man at the top produced a vision of what a company ought to be, and then led them in the creation of such a company. Yeah, let's get, oh, was, uh, I thought a hand was up back there. I just don't want to make my point. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I just don't want to make my point again. I'm trying to, to grasp what you're saying. Uh, then, management. There, there are ways of managing. One way of managing is through leadership. Yeah. That is inspiring those that are actually performing for the, the betterment or the good of the program, company, whatever. Is that leadership? Well, what you're saying is that one person can lead and manage. That's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible. Normally, leaders are not particularly good managers, and good managers are not particularly good leaders. And so they're normally distinctive functions that are quite different. So that's why in the military, for example, every good leader has a chief of staff who really runs things. He manages, but the CEO is the one who leads. Now, uh, the idea that you can take a manager and teach him how to lead is deceptive, because you can't. You can teach him how to manage better. But remember, what he's managing is the pursuit of his objectives, not of his followers' objectives. The difference in the leader is when Lenin led a revolution, he was leading people where they wanted to go. He takes people where they want to go, not where he wants them to go. The manager takes them where he wants them to go. That's a fundamental difference. Any other questions? Okay, then let me just... Uh, oh, I didn't make this point here. Inspiration differs from persuasion because it produces a willingness to make short-term sacrifices for long-term gains. Transformations require a change of direction and therefore a rejection of the status quo. That's what a leader must do, get you to reject the current state of affairs. A manager doesn't do that. A transformation requires courage from both the leader and his followers. You know, courage is a very interesting thing. That's the English translation of the American word guts. And uh, the most amazing thing I find, you know, in a normal year, I talk to two to 3,000 managers and executives. They don't lack knowledge. Uh, they don't lack the ability to communicate all these uh, things we talk about. What they lack is sheer guts. They lack the willingness to run risks in order to make improvements. Now we know why, and that's the terrible tragedy. Let me take a moment to show you why we have such a conservative culture and why organizations resist change. Because understanding it may give you some power to do something about it. All through school, you were taught that making a mistake is a bad thing, right? Because every time you make a mistake, you're downgraded. Therefore, you come out of school either trying to avoid making mistakes, or if you make a mistake, conceal it. And one of the best ways of doing that is get somebody else to take the blame. Shift the accountability for the mistake to somebody else. 
Now you come to work in a corporation or a government agency, and what do they say about mistakes? It's a bad thing. You better not make a mistake. Now, there are two kinds of mistakes. One is when you do something you shouldn't have done. That's called an error of commission. When Eastman Kodak bought Sterling Drug, which makes Bayer Aspirin and Lysol, they made a serious mistake. They later had to sell it and write off $2 billion in loss. They did something they shouldn't have done. Okay? When Anheuser-Busch bought Camel Tiger, a baking company, later had to sell it at a big write-off. That's an error of commission. But there are also errors of omission, not doing something you should have done. Eastman Kodak could have bought Xerox for $11 million at one point and didn't do it. Xerox could have been the largest producer in the world of laptop computers and it let it go so the job and Wozniak went out and created Apple. They didn't do it. Okay. Of the two types of mistake, commission and omission, which is the more serious? Omission. If you look at every case of failure or serious trouble, take IBM in the 1980s. It damn near went out of business until Lou Gerstner came along. What did they do that was wrong? It's not what they did, it's what they didn't do. What didn't they do? They didn't pay any attention to the small computer. They stuck with the mainframe when everybody else was going to miniaturization. Kodak is in very serious trouble today. Why? Paid no attention to digital photography. Do you know that Kodak could have bought Fuji at one point and didn't do it? Because they said the Japanese will never be able to take over the film business. What you didn't do. So errors of omission are more important than errors of commission, right? Now, look at your accounting system. Your accounting system will only record one of the two types of error. Which one? If you do something you shouldn't have done, commission, it will appear in the books, right? You buy Sterling Drug, it will appear when you write off. You buy Camel Tiger, it will appear when you don't buy Xerox. Where does it appear? Nowhere. Now, you're in a company that says making a mistake is a bad thing. The only kind of mistake you can get caught on is doing something you shouldn't have done. What's your best strategy? You got it. See, that's why we don't have change. And talking about leadership in that context is nonsense. Because what it requires fundamentally is an awareness that the most important type of error is the errors of omission, of recording and learning from those errors. Because the opportunities for learning are incredible. I recently went through one. The company we were working for had an opportunity for the purchase of another company that was incredibly attractive to it because of the overlap of functions. It did a due diligence study and figured out how much that company was worth given its current earnings. And it decided the rate of return was less than the potential buyer was earning on its own investments. So it decided not to invest and try to purchase the other company. Somebody got the other company at three times the value of the company put on by the first company decided not to bid. Now, I happened to be with the CEO the day that purchase was announced. And he said to me, you see, that guy's crazy. There is no way he can get a return on his investment for the amount he paid for that company. And I said, you're wrong. He said, what do you mean I'm wrong? He said, the difference is that you calculated what the value of the company is as it is. And he calculated the value of the company as it will be after he changes it. You made a fundamental mistake. You don't evaluate a company by its current value, but the value you can make it have after you make the changes that you plan to have. That man who bought the company at three times the price has a higher return on investment today than the original company does because he knew what to do with the acquired company. Peter Drucker did a marvelous study when Michi showed that out of six acquisitions, only one is successful. And the difference between the unsuccessful ones and the successful ones were this. In the unsuccessful ones, the acquiring company asked the following question. 
how can we increase our value by acquiring that company? In the successful case, the one out of six, the acquiring company said, how can I increase the value of the company I acquire? That was the difference. Uh, give you a specific case. We were doing work for Alcoa, and Charles Perry, who was the CEO of Alcoa, asked this, he said, we gotta diversify. He said, our, our business is too uh, fluctuating. We gotta get some stability in it by diversifying across products. He said, uh, I need your help, what, what should we diversify into? Well, we did a lot of initial inqu uh, inquiries and we finally decided that what he wanted to do was get in the high tech, but in the high tech that affected the environment. He had very, a great deal of interest in the environment because his own business, the production of aluminum, had a lot to do with the effect on environment. We found two small companies with very advanced technologies on the West Coast and he bought them. At the time he bought them, they had a 23% return on investment. This was Rota, Rota, return on total assets, right? Within one year, they were down to about 3%. He called us in, he said, what in the world has happened? You wanna guess what happened? The companies had not changed one damn bit. The difference was the overhead charge imposed on them by Alcoa. You see, it was completely wrong. How, he was asking, how can I use those companies to benefit Alcoa? Not how can I use Alcoa to benefit those companies? He eventually sold them and they soared, by the way. They become very successful larger companies. Because once they were freed of the, the yoke that Alcoa put on them, they had great success. Okay. Any other questions about leadership? Well, let me just get to the next subject and then we'll take a short break. We're almost there. Here we go. That's the next step we want to talk about. The conviction that management has that complex problems have simple-minded solutions. And the easiest way to make a living is to be a panacea public, uh, proponent. Management will buy any panacea that anybody has to offer. I have a list of 42 of them that are currently available for purchase. <laughs> they don't work. And the critical question is why, and after we take a short break, we'll talk about why they don't work. So we'll look at total quality management, benchmarking, downsizing, all those panaceas, none of which work. Okay, let's break for 15 minutes. Uh, one of the things I'm constantly confronted with when I talk to a group of managers is there's always somebody who is addicted to some of the, one of the current panaceas and they also wanna know what I think of them. And then I get into a good argument with them and I tell them they're not worth a damn. Uh, here's a partial list of some of the current panaceas. Process engineering is introduced by Hammer. Benchmarking, downsizing, total quality management, continuous improvement, learning organizations, core comp competencies, and so on down that list. Now we can't talk about each of them, but we're gonna talk about a few of them because most of them suffer from exactly the same ailment. They're anti-systemic, and that's what I want to show. Oh, oh, I got the wrong one. Okay. Most panaceas are failing or are failing to deliver what was promised because they're anti-systemic and are doing the wrong thing. Peter Drucker had a marvelous statement that has been inspirational to me. He said there's a difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. Doing things right is efficiency, but genocide can be done efficiently or not, but it's the wrong thing to do. Doing the right thing is talking about the value of the outcome. 
Doing the right thing is a matter of wisdom. Doing things right is a matter of knowledge and understanding. Every single major social problem confronting this country at this time is a result of doing the wrong thing. The righter you do the wrong thing, the wronger you become. If you make a mistake doing the wrong thing and correct it, you become wronger. If you make a mistake doing the right thing and correct it, you become righter. Therefore, it is better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. Now, what lies behind the claim that we keep doing things wrong? Well, we want to take a look at some of the things. Let's take total quality management first. There were two major national studies, one done by Arthur D. Little and the other one done by Young and Rubicam, and here are quotes out of their final analysis. Basically what this says, that two-thirds of the companies that introduced quality control consider the introduction to have been a failure. Two-thirds. It's one-third success. That's very high compared to most of the panaceas. What are the deficiencies in total quality from a systemic point of view? First of all, what is the quality directed at? Removing defects. Getting rid of what's wrong. Now, we talked at length about that this morning. What happens when you get rid of what you don't want? Hmm? You do not necessarily get what you do want. And some simple examples, the one I used this morning, the easiest one is a television set. If you go into a room where there's a television set that's off and turn it on, some program comes up, what's the probability it'll be a program you want? You probably haven't calculated it. I have. <laughs> it's 0 .01. One out of 100 times, it'll be a program I want. It's very easy to get rid of. All I have to do is turn the channel. What's the probability I'm going to get a program I want? It's still 0 .01, which means I got a 50-50 chance of getting a program I want less than the one I got first. Okay. When we try to get rid of alcoholism by the Volstead Act or Prohibition, we got organized crime. We try to get rid of mosquitoes using DDT, we killed a bunch of the birds and harmed all sorts of crops in the environment. Look what we're doing with mercury in the water now out of chemical plants and so on. Effective management must be directed at what you want, not against what you don't want. But more than 50% of the efforts of contemporary management is getting rid of what it doesn't want. And you can check that for yourself by just looking at decisions being made in your company. Are they directed to getting something you want or getting rid of what you don't want? The fact is most managers don't know what they want. What they know is what they don't want. It's very easy to say, I don't like asparagus. It's much more difficult to say what you do like. So, what are the deficiencies? You try and do the wrong thing by getting rid of defects. Quality control focuses on the quality of the product or service rendered, and that's absolutely wrong. Let me give you a, a couple stories. We introduced a system at Alcoa, Tennessee, which is the largest installation of the Alcoa Corporation, that went right down to the hourly paid worker. Shortly after we did that, two workers at the end of a, uh, one of the lines producing sheet aluminum, because that's what they produce in Tennessee, made a change that saved the company a million and a quarter dollars a year after taxes. It was a very simple idea, but absolutely beautiful, which avoided the crimping of the edge of aluminum coming off of a roll. When I heard this, I went down to congratulate them. There were two men in their 50s who had gone to work for Alcoa right out of high school. They'd been working there for over 25 years, and they were proud as punch of what they had done, as they should have been. When I praised them, they puffed up like peacocks. And then I said, how long have you known about this? And they both looked down and wouldn't answer me. I kept pressing, and finally one of them said, 15 years. I said, oh my God. Why did you wait 15 years to make the change? 
And I'll never forget what one of them said. I quote him exactly. Those sons of bitches never asked me before. The problem of quality is not the product, it's quality of work life. That's the critical variable. Where you have a satisfying quality of work life, you don't have to worry about quality of products because the people who are enjoying their work will produce a quality product. But where you have a lousy quality of work life, there's nothing you can do to make the quality of product good. You can talk Six Sigma all you want to. We were working at General Motors when they had a problem with the new model of the Buick. Uh, no, it was the Cadillac, I'm sorry. And it happened that a man came into Detroit, one of the dealerships, bought the most expensive Cadillac made. It was prepared for him, he drove it out of the dealership, and he hit a stretch of road about two blocks away that had just been raked for new paving. You know how they rake a road with little ridges? And the car rattled. He was furious, so he brought it back to the dealer and complained and said, get the rattle out. I didn't buy a rattle, I bought a Cadillac. The dealer apologized, gave him a loaner, called the, the uh, service manager, said, take this car back, go over it completely, and make damn sure that the rattle is out. Next day, the owner came back, was given the Cadillac, he drove it out, hit the same stretch of road, and it rattled. He brought it back and he was furious. He said, I want a new car, I don't want to discuss it anymore, or else give me my money back. Well, the dealer quieted him down, called the service manager, and said, did you really check this car? He said, yes, we did. We put it up on a rack. I had everybody in the shop check it. There is absolutely no loose part on the automobile. It can't rattle. The dealer said, did you take it out for a road test? He said, no, what was the point? There's nothing loose. <laughs> he said, take it out for a road test. Well, the reluctant service manager took it out, hit the stretch of road, and the car rattled came back red face, apologetic. He said, there's something inside the driver's side door that's rattling and he can't see it. He said, give me a little time, I, I goofed. I'll take it back and take the door apart and I'll find out what rattled. So he took the car back and as you know, it's two sheets of metal into which the window falls when you lower the window. In the bottom of that well, he found the Coke bottle. That's what was rattling. And inside the Coke bottle was a piece of paper. <laughs> and on that piece of paper, the following was written. So you finally found it, you rich son of a bitch. <laughs> now, do you think quality control is going to make that guy produce a quality product? He resents the employment so deeply that he's looking for ways to screw the employer. That's the central problem in quality. It's not product. It's quality of work life. Per Gillenhammer, one of the greatest corporate leaders I've ever known, was the CEO of Volvo. And in his incredible wisdom, he asked his young head of human resources, who's the best HR manager I've ever seen, a young man called Berth Johnson, to do the following study. What percentage of what our employees know that's relevant to their jobs do we allow them to use? Isn't that a wonderful question? Took two years of research. The answer was 23%. 23% of what they know that's relevant to their job they can use. Gillenhammer, who organized the seven, the famous seven in Europe, in his opening address to them, gave this number and said, if we use any other resource as poorly as we use human beings, we would not be able to survive at all. What's the problem of quality? It's the inability to use people effectively. It has nothing to do with product. And all these goddamn histograms and statistical analysis and standard deviations and Six Sigma are nonsense unless you have a good quality of work life. We talked at lunch about quality of work life. And it's a very simple concept. It's nothing complicated. If you want to find out what a quality of work life is in your organization and what your quality of work life is, just answer the following question. One question. If I told you right now that your current salary is guaranteed to you for the rest of your life in constant dollars, no matter what you did, what would you do tomorrow? 
Well, I can tell you what happens. If you ask uh, the heads of corporations this question, what do you think the answer is? Come back tomorrow. Of course, it's fun. You ask the professors at a major university, what would you do if your salary were guaranteed to you? You see, you can't get rid of the goddamn professors. They keep coming around if they <laughs> retire because it's fun. But ask the graduate teaching assistant or the, dollar, the hourly paid employee the same question, what do they say? We get out of here like a bat out of hell. It's the inequitable distribution of the quality of work life that's a major problem in corporations, not quality of product. You get lousy product because we have lousy quality of work life. You take a good corporation, like SAS that I mentioned, or Herman Miller, they don't have quality programs, they don't need them. Because the workers make damn sure that the products go out are ones that they're proud of. In fact, in some of those corporations, each product is actually signed by the last worker who worked on it. And a card comes in its carton which says, if you have any complaints, please call me at the following number. See, that's employee pride in the product. Ignorance that the consumer wants, it's a beauty. You want to find out what the customer wants, you know, everybody ought to know what the customer wants, you go out and ask them. What a stupid damn thing to do. Because the consumer don't know what they want. That's not ignorance, it's just they have no reason to know what they want. You ask them, they, you know, they want to be obliging, they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. Learning what they want is a matter of discovery. And fortunately, every architect learns this early. See, when that family came in to see me for a design of a house, they gave me a whole list of what they wanted. And when I produced the first sketches for them, it had all those properties in it. And they looked at it and said, well, that's not quite what we had in mind. And they started to modify it. We went through five iterations before we got a design that contained what they wanted. The point is you discover what people want in the process of design. If you want to find out what you want in an automobile, design one. Don't answer the question, what do you want in an automobile? Let me give you an example. Uh, there was a Russian immigrant who came to the United States in about 1880, had a little bit of money and a wife, and he bought a push cart in the Jewish ghetto of Philadelphia. On that push cart, he started to sell men's underwear. And he had an idea. There were poor people, but he wasn't going to sell them a low quality of merchandise at a low price. He was going to get a good quality of underwear and sell it at a highly discounted price using volume to compensate for lack of profit per item sold. And he flourished. Pretty soon, he bought another push cart by his side and introduced men's shirts. And before long, he had five push carts in a row selling most of the clothing that men used. He couldn't get any further push carts, but a store behind them emptied. So he rented that store and opened the first so-called pipe rack men's store in Philadelphia. Just an empty store with pipe racks in which he had clothing hanging, and it flourished. By the time of World War II, he owned the entire block had taken out all the walls and had the largest men's store in Philadelphia. And he died. His son inherited the business. His son came to hear me, to see me one day, hear me one day. And he said he, when he inherited the business, he had two ambitions, one of which he had succeeded in, the other he failed completely. He said, I wanted to make a chain out of the stores, and I have. For those of you who know the East, Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> the chain is called Today's Man. He said, but I have failed in my other aspiration. He said, the quality of our merchandise is still high. It's the same quality as Brooks Brothers. You all know Brooks Brothers? But we sell at one-third less than Brooks Brothers does. But we cannot get Brooks Brothers customers. And that's my frustration. He said, can you help me find out how I can get Brooks Brothers customers into our stores? So he said, no, that's not our field. That's marketing research. Why don't you hire a market research fund? He said, I did. 
I've had three of them. They've gone out. They've interviewed Brooks Brothers customers. They come back with recommendations. We've implemented them all, and it doesn't make any difference at all. Then why'd you come to us? He said, because you don't know anything about the subject. He said, that may be a distinct advantage. What would you do if you had this problem? He said, we go out and we get a group of Brooks Brothers customers and bring them into the university and give them a day to redesign the men's store. And that's what we did. We got 18 professionals, accountants, professors, doctors, lawyers, and so on, all Brooks Brothers customers. Brought them in, didn't tell them who the sponsor was. So you got a day to design your ideal men's store. By three o'clock, they had completed, they reached agreement, at which time we brought the three senior managers of today's man in, and they reported on their findings, and nobody in the business had ever conceived of the kinds of things they came up with. And they never would have come up by asking them, what do you want in a men's store? Number one, they said, you work on the assumption that when we go out to buy something, we want to find the lowest price for a given quality of merchandise. You've got it absolutely backwards. What we do is decide how much we're going to spend before we go out, and we want the highest quality for a fixed price. You've got it backwards. Number two, you assume that we like to shop. <laughs> we hate it. And therefore, we never go out to buy one item at a time. So we need a sports coat, a raincoat, and shirts. Come to your stores. What do we have to do? Go to three different departments, three different checkout clerks. Why can't you arrange the clothing by size instead of by type of clothing? So I can go into a room for 42 44s, and all the clothing suitable for me is in one place. Arrange it for my convenience, not yours. Get rid of the damn salesman. Why don't you put buttons around like on an airline so that when I'm ready for a salesperson, I push a button and one appears and never a man. You can't trust a man's opinion on how you look. <laughs> Keep our wives out of the store. Give them a lobby up front so we can show them what we picked after we picked it, but don't have them with us when we're picking it. And so on. You see, all that kind of stuff came out when they had to design a store. By the way, today's man built a couple of those stores and they got Brooks Brothers customers coming out of their ears. You have to give customers the opportunity to design. We did one recently, you'd never guess, I wouldn't have, Certain Teed, the second largest producer of roofing materials in the world, asked us to find out what did consumers want in a roof? Now that was really exciting. These are residential houses. We had five different groups. We had architects in one group, building contractors in another, roofing material people, roofing contractors, and people building houses come on in separate groups. And they reached complete agreement between them. And they did something that had never been done. You know what they wanted in the roof? Color. Did you ever see a roof with color? It's always gray or brown with a few little shadow lines. But they were building roofs, because in our laboratory, they actually build roofs. They look like Mondrian paintings. You know Mondrian? You know, with the bright colors and blocks with black lines surrounding them. They had the most beautiful roofs you've ever seen. This company has started to produce those roofs. But they learned something out of it they never knew. We brought these people in to design a roof at 7 o'clock at night into a laboratory where they could build a roof for a house in small scale. And the idea was they'd build one roof and then go home. But they wouldn't go home. They stayed there at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning building roofs. They got to like it so much. You know what the principal result of that study was? They now equip their retailers with the materials that customers can come in and build a model of their roof to decide what kind of roof they want. They changed the marketing method to design. So design is the critical way here. Then finally, this last point, quality programs depend on what's called continuous improvement. You never become a leader by continuously improving. That's a way of following the leader. The leader is always a discontinuous improvement. It's a breakthrough, something that's completely different. 
When Apple recently produced iPod, it wasn't an extension of something which existed. It was a new thing. It wasn't a continuation of something old. When the laptop first came out, it wasn't a continuation of what's old. It was a breakthrough. If you went around and asked people 20 years ago, would you like to have a computer that sits on your desk? You know, they would have thought, you're crazy. We go under the principle that necessity is the mother of invention. That's true. But there's another even more important truth. Invention is the mother of necessity. Hmm? All of a sudden, VCRs appear on the market and everybody needs one. Who the devil walked around saying, I need a handheld calculator? I bet every one of you got two or three of them today. But 20 years ago, nobody even thought about that possibility. You had either a Frieden or a Marchand. That was the most, you could get this big awkward thing on a, on a desk. So the quality program is based on a set of assumptions which are anti-systemic and false, and that's why most of them don't succeed. Benchmarking. Does it look sensible? Uh, here's something you do like purchasing. What well, somebody out there is purchasing more efficiently than you are, why don't I find out what they're doing and do it? You realize that over 80% of the benchmarking efforts result in increased costs? They do, research has shown it. Can you guess why? Doesn't fit, exactly. You're improving a part without looking at how that part affects the performance of the whole. So I make the part better, but the whole becomes worse. And benchmarking consistently does that. Because that part company that's doing purchasing better than you're doing it has a total system into which that kind of purchasing can fit. But it won't fit in your system. It's antagonistic to the system. So in benchmarking, you benchmark the whole, never the part. But if you do the whole right, you never have to benchmark. And that's through competition. See, when you've got to compete with others, you better know what they're doing and do it at least as well as they're doing. But that's as a whole, not necessarily in part. Uh, a wonderful example is Anheuser-Busch, which is the largest brewer in the world. At one point, this is literally true, they used to say that they spilled more beer than anybody else in the world made. And that was equally true. Uh, when we started to work with Anheuser-Busch in 1957, they had 9.2% of the market. They were number one. Schlitz, which was number two, had 8.4%. So this doesn't exist anymore. Anheuser-Busch has 51% of the market today. They're the high cost producer because they produce beer in the most costly way known to man. That's what the Beechwood aging is all about. I don't know why they keep it as a secret, but they do. Beechwood aging has a very significant effect on beer, it costs more. Cost them one third more to produce a can of beer than anybody else. Now, how could they get to that position? They didn't try to imitate the way other people produce beer. They tried to imitate Schlitz, they'd be out of business. Because Schlitz kept trying to reduce costs and got it to the place where the only way they could reduce costs more was by changing the taste. And they went out of business because of a lousy taste to the beer. But Anheuser Busch is the most efficient marketer in the United States. Their cost of marketing per unit sold is the absolute minimum. That was an imitation of anybody else. It was a vice president who said, we want to make the best product and that's going to cost money. But if we're going to compete, we have to have low cost in getting it into the market. So what cost are we going to reduce? Not materials, we're going to continue to use the best materials available. The only thing left is marketing. So the whole focus came on to how to reduce marketing costs. Now they advertise a lot, but they spend less in advertising per unit sold than any one of their competitors by a large margin because they understand something that no other brewer in the world understands. They supported three years of research on the simple question, why do people drink beer? 
I'll never forget when we raised that question for the first time, the vice president of marketing, a wonderful guy by the name of Ed Vogel, said to us, we know why they drink beer, what are you asking that for? We said, why? Tell us. He said, because they like it. We said, how do you know they like it? He said, what the hell, they drink it, don't they? <laughs> we said, you know, that's no explanation at all. He said, well, what is an explanation? He said, I don't know. It's going to take a lot of research. Because people don't know why they drink beer. We'll have to find out. And it took several years, and we did find out. And they have a distinct advantage over any other brewer, because they know why people drink, drink beer. And so they can design products for different segments of the market, because they know that different segments have different reasons for drinking. That's been the secret of their success. Now, it's not unique to them. We were working for McNeil Laboratories, which are now a part of Johnson Johnson, which manufactures Tylenol. We started, Tylenol was a prescribed drug, okay? They came across the counter, what they called an over-the-counter drug, OC drug, and we designed the marketing strategy for that drug. What was the distinctive characteristic of it that they could advertise? And of course, the fact that it won't upset your stomach. Acetaminophen, unlike aspirin, will not cause bleeding. They drilled this, they didn't do any advertising, they just went to see the doctors and convinced the doctors that this was so, and the doctors sold the product for them. They became the largest headache pill in the United States. And then a fascinating thing happened. Everybody says we're better than Tylenol, right? You see the ads all over, you know, Advil, two pills of Advil equals eight pills of Tylenol. But you know Tylenol is still the largest selling pill in the United States? Why? Because they understand something about advertising that nobody else does. When you advertise comparing your product against something else, you are always benefiting the thing you advertise against more than you benefit yourself. Because you're declaring them as a standard of performance. So when Ford started to advertise, remember a couple years ago that the Mercury is as good as the Mercedes? <laughs> Mercedes sales went up like hell and Mercury went down like that because they established Mercedes as the standard of quality. 